Right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. I quite a lot of people here, actually, which is always good, uh, especially with the other talks that we have here. I'm pretty good as well. Um, so my name is Marcus. I work at a very big company in the UK called Sky. And today I'm here to talk to you about how you can write your own plugin for Android Studio to automate pretty much everything. And by everything, I mean all those interactions that you might have to make with other tools like Jira or Trello, or maybe your own tools that you develop uh, your own company or any backend systems, and also any repetitive tasks that you have to do on a daily basis, like maybe setting up a new project, a new feature module, a uh, new MVP pattern, MVVM, uh, all that kind of stuff. So the main takeaway from today's talk, really, is that you should stop spending time or wasting time on things that don't add any value, like everything that I've just said. Like, there is no value or very little value in going to Jira to just move a ticket or log in time or creating like um, a new MVP pattern, like I, like I said, because most of the time the thing that you're really going to do is you're going to go to some other place in your code base, copy paste some files, and then just rename them. And that, I think, is a, a waste of time. And of course, there are like many, many ways where you can automate all these processes. Like you could just write a script in Perl, Ruby, whatever, and store that uh, on your repo. But it turns out that actually writing a plugin for, for Android Studio is pretty easy. And the best thing is that it's integrated with the IDE itself, which means that you can also share that with your colleagues. And they don't need to know about Ruby or Perl or anything else if they want to extend our plugin or do anything like that. And, and of course, like you can do that also with Kotlin, which is uh, pretty cool as well. So uh, before I go any farther, I'm just going to show you what I'm talking about. Um, so sorry, because I have to see it. Um, so I want to show you uh, what I mean by this. Uh, all the code that I'm going to be showing you today and the thing that I'm going to run right now is in these two repos. Uh, so please go check them out. Uh, I'm going to be posting uh, the slides on my Twitter account afterwards anyway, so don't worry about that. Um, so let's see what I'm talking about here. So, so hopefully this should work if the internet connection is all right. Um, so what I have here is just like a very simple Android Studio project. Um, I have uh, different modules. Like I have an article list module, article reader, core module, because everyone needs core, right? Um, and I'm just going to follow like the normal flow that you might have at your own company, which is uh, usually you just go to Jira, and you pick a ticket, read what that ticket is about, move that to in progress, sign that ticket to yourself, go back to Android Studio or your console, create a new branch, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so because I'm lazy, I don't really want to want to do that. So what I have here is I have an action uh, with my plugin, which is going to automatically show me all the tickets that I have in my to-do list. So I can just pick the one that I want. Uh, so this first one. And here it says what we're going to do now. So we're just going to create an app with three sections, like a politics section, sports section, and a weather section. So I'm going to be using the New York Times API for this. And basically, we're going to have different behaviors. So for the politics, whenever I click on an article, I'm going to show just a toast with the URL. And for the sports one, I'm going to actually go to my article reader module to just display that URL in a web view. So uh, nothing very special there. So I just hit OK. And you can see automatically that a new branch has been created. And it's using the Jira ID as well for that. So I don't even have to do that anymore. And if I go back to Jira, you can see that the ticket is now in progress and it's been assigned to myself. And I didn't have to waste any time. I just had to click the OK button. So um, let's crack on with this. So we're going to create a new module here. And these are the normal modules that you have here. But because I have my own plugin and I've written all these modules, I know that everyone I want to integrate them, I'm going to have to be writing the same code. So what I have here is my own template to build a new app. So I can just hit next. Uh, let's call this demo. And now uh, here we have all the basic scaffolding for my app. And this is not the scaffolding that you get when you create a new Android uh, app. Like you can see here that we have different things. Like we have this app, uh, uh, the application here, and the main activity, and, and some other stuff. 
Um, so this is like the basic scaffolding. Now we, what we need to do is we need to add some, some features here. So I'm just going to go inside here. So that's the stuff. And, and again, like same with that, you will go to new activity or anything like that. I have this demo template here. And one of them is to create a New York Times article list. So I click there. Um, I'm just in the navigation architecture component. So I'm going to say that this is going to be a star destination. And the section that I want to show is politics. Uh, actually, put this. And when I click on an article, I just want to show a toast. So I'm going to leave that as it is. And then hit finish. And that's it. That's our uh, New York Times list uh, done. Um, I'm going to show you, actually, uh, the Gradle file. So that one. Um, so just you can see what's going on here as well. Um, I'm going to now do the uh, sport section. So again, come back here. This time it doesn't have to be a star destination, so I'm just going to go with sports. And in this case, I want to use the article reader module that I have. So I go there, click there, I hit finish. And one of the things you can see is that now I have also the dependency for that module here. So that was added automatically. I don't have to write that code anymore. And the last thing is just, uh, again, like very quickly, we're going to add the weather one. Again, it's not star destination. And let's just see the weather that we have here in Paris today. Um, that's it. That's our app done in around like two minutes. So I'm just going to build that and see what happens. <coughs> While this builds, I'm going to show you something else like very quickly as well. Um, these are my settings for my plugin. So I'm going to show you today how can you add these settings into the Android preferences as well, which is uh, quite handy. And also, I'm going to show you uh, what a live template is. And again, how can you share those live templates? So um, to do that, let's imagine that I want to create a new Dagger component, right? So um, like I go here, I just create like a new component. Let's say this is a class, although it's not. Um, so if I wanted now to create a Dagger component, I need to remember that I need the annotation component. I need a list of modules or just one module. Might have need some dependencies. And I also have to remember that it's not really a class because it is an interface. So what I can do instead is I can just uh, delete this. And I'm going to use uh, what's called a live template. So it's just basically a way to create um, common constructs like very, very quickly. So I do D for dagger, C for component, hit OK. And that's going to create all that code for me automatically. And you can also see that it's hinting me to put a module there as well. Um, so I'll show you how can you share this stuff as well. Um, and now if we go back to the app, and if we have like a good internet connection, because you can ask for everything, you will see that we have like a politics section, sports section, and a weather section that it doesn't really work because internet, right? So, um, so that's one thing. Um, then after you finish with everything, what you can do here is that um, you commit your code, you push that code, and then obviously you want to move that to the next um, to the next column, uh, the ticket in Jira. So rather than having to do that, again, I have another action here that's going to detect the Jira ticket automatically because my branch name uses the Jira ID there. And it's going to say that the next transition available for me is ready for QA. And then I can just write a comment. I can just say, like, hello, Paris, and click OK. And in theory, this should have been moved to ready for QA. And there is the hello Paris uh, comment there as well. So this is the kind of stuff that um, you can do with your, uh, with your plugin. So let's go back to the presentation here. So that's kind of like the stuff that you can do. Like we were able to write an app in like around two minutes because we knew the code that we had to write. It's always the same code. It doesn't change in that case. Like in some other cases, of course, it's going to change, and you're still going to have to write some code. But most of the integration, you can do that automatically. So let's see how, how we do this. So to create a plugin, uh, I think the easiest way is just using uh, IntelliJ IDEA community version, mainly because it's free, and using the Gradle IntelliJ plugin. 
because I think for me, Gradle just makes sense. It's what we're used to in the Android world. Uh, so everything that we're going to see is going to be um, kind of like familiar for us. And it just makes more sense than using other things like the dev kit. Um, so quite simple. Again, you go file, uh, new, you select project, you pick Gradle, you select the uh, IntelliJ platform plugin, and then you pick your language, in this case, Kotlin. And this is what you're going to end up with. And everything there, again, is quite familiar because we're using Gradle. Uh, the only thing different is this plugin XML file. So here's where we're going to have to put a lot of the metadata for a plugin. And we're going to have to also uh, write some XML code there to declare different things that we're going to see in later on. And, and of course, you have your build Gradle file, which uh, it looks quite similar to what we already have on an Android app. So you can have your dependencies there. And, and you can depend on pretty much everything that you want. You can, if you want to use Rx, you can do that. If you want to use Dagger, you can do that. Um, just bear in mind that this is not really an Android application, so you can't really use everything. Uh, so careful with what you put there. And also, you might have noticed that uh, we're using compile when you're using implementation or API. And that is because the Gradle IntelliJ plugin XML doesn't currently support implementation or API just yet. So we have to stick with compile for now. Um, this is a new section that you haven't seen before. And this is just a quick way for us to be able to run a Gradle task to just publish our plugin into the IntelliJ repository. Uh, it's very simple, token, password, different channels that you want to publish, and that's done. And this is kind of like the main section that we have here uh, when, when we want to write a plugin. So we're going to have a look at this. Uh, so the first thing I want to focus is, is local path. Um, so local path is the, it points to the path of the version of idea that you want to use as a dependency for your plugin. So in other words, like we all know that Android Studio is based on IntelliJ IDEA. So this is our way to say that our plugin is going to have Android Studio as a dependency. So everything that is available in the IDE, we're going to be able to use that. And that's how we do this. Um, this is also quite, quite helpful as well, because if we wanted to debug our plugin, because we're pointing to Android Studio, it's going to debug that in Android Studio. So it's going to spin up a new, uh, a new instance of Android Studio instead of a new instance of the idea, uh, IDE. Um, so that's fine, but there's another way of doing the same thing, which is using version. And in this case, version is the version of idea. It's not the version of Android Studio. Um, so we'll see how you can get that number as well here. And because it's not really pointing to Android Studio, we need to define this alternative IDE path to, again, tell IntelliJ that we want to be able to debug our plugin in Android Studio. So this, again, will spin up a new instance of Android Studio, and so on and so forth. So how do you get that version here? Um, that comes from the uh, Android Studio releases. So you can just go there, and you will see which version of IDEA this specific build of Android Studio was based on. And it is kind of important that you get this right, because if you point to the latest version of IDEA, you might use some APIs that are not available yet for Android Studio. So you want to be careful with this. And if you're just writing a plugin for Android Studio, you probably want to point to the right version there. Um, another section here is this uh, plugins array, which just tells us the plugins that our plugin is going to depend on. And so these are all plugins that you can find in the IntelliJ repository. And in this case, we depend on Kotlin because that's what we're using. Uh, Git for IDEA is just the plugin that deals with Git branches and, and all that stuff. And then Android because we're going to do some stuff with the Android plugin as well. And we also need to define those dependencies in this plugin XML file. And basically, this is how you do that. Right, very simple. Um, before I move any farther, I want to tell you like uh, kind of like an edge case, I guess, with the Android plugin. And that's the fact that I'm just in local path here. Because if you look at other repos for like the, mass, the vast majority of plugins, they are actually using version and alternative IDE path. Um, 
And this was fine back in Understudio Lite 3.1 and, and so on. That, that were actually fine. But once we move on to 3.2 or 3.3.1 or 3.4, I uh, haven't checked 3.5 yet, um, this actually doesn't really work. Um, so the reason is because some classes within the Android plugin were moved to different packages. And for some reason, there is a bug in the uh, Gradle plugin that can't really find them. So it's a very annoying thing. I've talked to a lot of people, and no one can seem to find a solution for this. So instead of just inversion, you need to use local path if you want to use those specific like three classes. Um, so let's move on and explain a bit like basic plugin structure, like the main elements that you're going to have there. Uh, um, so we start with plugin components. So the component is the most basic concept of plugin integration here. And we have like three different types. So we have application level components, which uh, are created every time the IDE starts up. Then we have project level components that are created for each project instance that we have in the IDE. And then, of course, we have module level components that are for each module within each project and so on and so forth. So let's start having a look at some code. Um, let's imagine that we want to do something like, so when the IDE starts up, we want to detect if our plugin was updated. And then we want to show the user like a message saying what's new there, for instance. So to do that, because we know that we want to do that when the ID starts up, we're going to have to implement the application component. Uh, there's also another one called project component and module component, so you can just use whichever one you want there, really. Um, and this allows us to override this method called init component. So this is what's going to happen when the IDE launches. And so it's going to try to initialize the component, and it's going to run this method. So here we can just say, well, if there is a new version, then just do something. Um, I'm going to do like a very naive implementation that you should definitely not do. Um, so just for simplicity, let's assume that I'm going to handle the versions manually. So version is the new version or the latest version of my plugin. Local version is the version that was uh, installed. So I just have like two simple methods to check if there is a new version and another one to update the local version as well so it doesn't run again. So uh, if there is a new version, I show the message and I then update the version so it doesn't get triggered again. Like, again, don't do this, please. Um, um, so this is going to work. Now the idea is going to start up. It's going to see that the version is greater than the local one. It's going to show a message. And, and that's, that's just fine. The only problem is that the next time that we open Android Studio, it's going to do the same thing again. Because we're not persisting the state of the component yet. We're not storing those values anywhere. Um, so to do that, we need to implement this uh, persistent state component interface here. And it's going to give us two methods, one to save the state and another one to get the state. And you can see here, like, the implementation is, is very, very simple. Get state just returns the component and load state saves the component. It serializes that uh, using a Java bin. And because it's doing that, we also need to implement serializable there as well. The last thing that we need to do here is we need to tell where we want to store this data. And the way that persistent state component works is that it stores everything on an XML file. So we also need to declare that XML file using the state annotation. So there we just define where the XML is going to be. And, and then the last thing is declaring the component in the plugin XML file. And you're going to see this a lot, because we're going to have to declare pretty much everything inside that plugin XML file. Let's move on to actions. So an action is, well, basically everything that you do when you go to a menu or a toolbar or anything like that, and you click on, um, I don't know, new something or cut or copy, that's all an action. Um, and so like I say, like everything that you can see there is basically an action. You can group actions, um, and you can do like a lot of things with this, really. And this is how you uh, create an action. It's, again, it's very simple. You uh, implement an action, and then just do whatever you want to do in the action perform method. And like everything, you have to declare that in the plugin XML file as well here. 
Um, so I'm going to go a bit deeper here, uh, not too much though. So here you can see that we have to define the class that we want to use when this action is triggered. Uh, you have the text, the description. You can also use um, a keyboard shortcut if you want. You can put that as well here. In this case, we're using Control-Alt-K. But bear in mind that Control on a MacBook is actually command. So just take that into consideration. And then the last thing that you have to do is you need to add this action to a group. So in this case, we're adding it to the cut, copy, paste group. And because we're setting the anchor as last, it's going to be the last action inside that specific group. Um, you can find all the different groups, like you could just command click on that group and it takes you to an XML with all the different groups that you have available. You can create your own groups. You can reduce groups so you don't really have to do add to group every single time. You can just have the reference to that group. Uh, there's a lot of stuff here that you can do. Uh, everything is explained in this uh, URL, which is uh, very helpful. And the last thing before we actually see some proper code are extensions and extension points. So this is what we use if we want our plugin to extend the functionality of other plugins or the IDE itself. So if we're going to do that, we declare an extension. If we want to allow our plugin to be extended by other plugins, then we declare an extension point. So let's see some code now. And before that, I just want to tell you that you're still writing code. Um, so all the best practices that you apply with an app or when you write any code, they should be applied here as well. Uh, you can just go to the uh, IntelliJ repo of plugins and go through all the GitHub repos there. And you're going to see that most of the plugins that you're going to find there, they have all their code inside an action. So if you will input your code inside an activity, then you should input all your code inside an action. It's exactly the same principle. So just use whatever you want, really. Use MVP, use MVC, use MVVN, whatever, really. Just apply those best practices as well, because this is still code that you're going to have to maintain, you're going to have to test, and you're going to have to extend at some point as well. So um, let's have a look at this action where I move a ticket in Jira from one column to another. Uh, it's quite simple. So I have a Jira move action there, and this has uh, a dialog. And then just using, just for simplicity, like a very s simple MVP pattern there. And then the Jira move dialog also has a panel. So I guess the question is, why do we have a panel? Like if we already have a dialog, what is this panel? And to tell you what this is, I need to tell you how you write UI. And yes, <laughs> it's beautiful. So this is how you write UI for your plugin. You have to use our beautiful friend, uh, the Java Swing forms. So if you know them, then uh, sorry. And, <laughs> it, it, and if you don't know them, then welcome. Um, so the, the reason why we have to do this using Java Swing Forms is because IntelliJ wants us to be consistent with the UI of the ID. So they give us a lot of different Java Swing Forms, a lot of uh, different views that we can use just to be consistent. Um, this is going to be so much fun. So um, I'm just going to tell you like a quick tip, something that works for me, so please don't judge me. This is the editor for Java Swing Forms in IntelliJ. And I just don't like it. I find it like very, very difficult to work with. So what I use instead is Eclipse. <laughs> I, don't judge me. <laughs> um, you can really use whatever you want. Uh, like for me, this is just easier for whatever reason. And the only thing that I actually end up doing is just uh, copy the code, convert that to Kotlin, and paste that back. So uh, but again, you can use whatever tool that works for you, even Eclipse. Um, so what is this panel? Well, it's just a class that extends from JPanel, and then that's just the UI there that you can convert to Kotlin from Eclipse or from any other place if you want. So. Right, so we have a panel with a UI. Why do we need a dialog then? Like, what's the point then? Um, and to explain that, I'm just going to show you the code of the dialog. Like, this is part of the code. Uh, you can see like few things that you might recognize, like Dagger and things like that. Um, 
but what's important here is that we are uh, implementing this dialog wrapper. And dialog wrapper is something that IntelliJ, again, gives us for free. And it's something that they say we must use for all the different dialogues in our plugin. And again, like to keep the UI consistent. And this, act this wrapper actually gave us like a few goodies. Like it gives us for free the OK and cancel button. It gives us the ability to resize and keep that dialogue resized to the, to the latest size that the user uh, wanted to. So we get a lot of things for free. And one of the methods that you have to implement is this create center panel. And you can see here that the only thing that I'm doing is just returning the J panel that I created before. So if we look at this, this is our dialog wrapper. This is our panel. And what we're doing is like we're just putting them together, basically. And that's why we need these two. Again, you could have the panel within the dialog, but I think it's just nicer to separate those concerns a little bit more. And the last thing that we do here is like we just uh, override the do OK action method. So whatever happens when we press OK, then we just use the presenter to do the transition or whatever you want to do there. Um, another tip, and it's not as bad as the Eclipse one, I promise. Um, if you want to use Rx, you can still use that, obviously. Um, but this is not an Android app, so you cannot use the Android scheduler's main thread anymore. Uh, in fact, you need to observe on the event dispatch thread. So to do that, you can just use uh, this other library here, which provides us with a swing scheduler, and that EDT stands for event dispatch thread. So you can just use that instead, and everything uh, will just work again. So that's it for an action. Let's have a look at how can you uh, create some settings here. Um, so we need to store the settings in a place. And in this case, what I wanted to do was having different settings depending on the project. Because I don't know, maybe you're a contractor. And depending on the project, you have to log in on different Jira instances for whatever reason. Uh, so in this case, we're going to implement project component instead, because we want that to be on a project basis. And the rest of the component is exactly the same thing that we saw before. Nothing changes there, apart from the fact that now we have different attributes. But everything else is just the same. As for the, well, and then obviously you need to declare that in the plugin XML, like everything. As for the UI, um, again, same thing. We just create a new J panel, and we create the UI there. The only difference here is that now you have to implement configurable. And here's where we're using one of the extensions of the IDE, because we want to extend the preferences of Android Studio. So we're going to use this configurable extension. And then we have to provide the project because it's going to be based on a project basis. So depending on the project, we're going to get different settings. So this uh, configuration gives us uh, four methods. Um, so let's see what they do. It's modify just basically what enables or disables the apply button on the settings. Uh, so let's say that's always going to be false for now, and we'll care about this later. Display name is just the name that you're going to see on the preferences, so nothing special there. Apply is what happens when you click on the Apply button. And what we do here, uh, it's kind of simple, we just take the user's input, and then we save them in the project component that we created before. And then we change the modify value to false, because the Apply button should be disabled at that point again. And then Create Component is just the opposite. We take the values from the project component, and then we set the UI based on those values. So if the user save uh, the username as Marcos, once he goes back, he can just see that the username was Marcos again. And then we return a main panel. And that main panel is the J panel that we created for the UI. Uh, but again, like we're not really changing the value of this modify, so it's always false. So we need a way to <coughs> enable the apply button whenever the users change something. And to do that, we have this other interface called document listener. So we add a new document listener for each of the attributes there. And then we implement these three methods, which basically are going to change the modify Boolean to true if the user changes, inserts something, or removes uh, anything from those fields as well. I like everything else. You need to declare that extension in the plugin XML file as well. 
So um, let's crack on with live templates now. So we saw what a live template is before when I was doing uh, the DC kind of like shortcut to create a new Dagger component here. I'm not gonna go deep into how can you create them because this is more about how can you share them. So I'm just gonna give you like a very quick introduction about this. If you wanna create a new live template, you can just go to the Android Studio Preferences, go to the editor, and there you have this live template section. You can just create a new one. You can write your code there. You can add variables. Uh, you can also edit those variables and give them an expression or a default value, uh, that kind of stuff. But the real question for me is, how can you share them? And the usual answer is, well, you just put them, put them in a jar, or you just share the XML file and then pass that to a different uh, colleague so they can install this. But again, this is like a manual step that I don't really want to do. So for me, the question is, how do I share this with my plugin? I want to write my own template so I can ship them with my plugin. So how do we do that? So we can just take the XML file of those templates and move that inside the resources folder of our plugin. So they're gonna be available there. And then we have to create another extension for Android Studio. And this extension is like really simple, it just has two methods. So the first one is to return the place where we are storing our templates in our plugin. So here we just return the folder where they are. And because we don't wanna hide any templates there, we pass null on the second method. And again, like everything else, we have to declare this extension in the plugin XML file. And just to finish off, uh, let's go with the most interesting bit, I guess, which are templates. So this is everything when I was doing um, demo template and adding like the New York's time uh, integration or when I was creating like a new module, this is that kind of stuff that we're talking about. So everything that you can see there is basically a template. And Again, I'm not gonna go deep into how can you create them, but there are basically two ways. One is just going to the new menu, edit file templates, and there you can just write your code for your template, and that's it. There's just one small problem with this, and it's the fact that in this case, one template can only create one file, and this is not really what we wanna do, because if you wanna create like an MVVM pattern, you need to create different files, so this is not gonna be very useful. Instead, um, what we can do is that we can go to where the templates are actually being stored within Android Studio, which is uh, in that folder there. And if we look at the content, uh, there are like a bunch of templates for every single thing that you can do within Android Studio. And if we scroll down, there is this other folder. And this is the place where Android Studio allows us to store our own templates as well. So if we put our templates here, then they're gonna be recognized by Android Studio and they're gonna appear on this uh, template section when you go to, new, to the new menu. And to write this kind of templates, we need like a few elements. Uh, first one, we need this template XML file, which is gonna define the UI. We need the actual templates with our FTL files. Uh, you can have global variables that are shared between the different templates. And then everything goes into a recipe XML file, which defines um, the code that is then gonna be generated. So again, quickly going through all these uh, files. So this is how the template XML looks like. So we have like the first section, which is like the revision, depending on the version of the template that you're on, minimum API, description, things like that. Uh, the category is the actual name that you can see on the um, templates menu. And then here's where the magic happens, like with parameters. You can have parameters that are booleans, you can have strings, you can have lists, so you, that'll give you a drop down. If you use a boolean, that'll give you a checkbox. You can set constraints, so you don't want this to be empty. You can set default values, so you could say, depending on the value of this other parameter, which is a boolean, I wanna apply this method to the result of that, so, I mean, you can do like a lot of crazy things. This is like a very, very powerful tool here. Um, the recipe is just a set of instructions, so you can have, you can instantiate um, a file by using a template, so you say, this is a template I wanna use, and this is the file that it's gonna create. You can just copy a file as it is, very useful for things like git ignore, or resources like PNGs, or things like that, where you don't have any variables there. Um, NKDIR creates 
directory includes is going to include another recipe and execute them. So again, very useful if you want to separate concerns a bit more, like I want to have ProGuard separated, I want to have Gradle separated, you can do that as well. Um, merge, it's also very useful, it's a shame though, because you can only use merge with Gradle files and with XML files. So you cannot merge Java files or Kotlin files or anything that's not Gradle. Um, so this is when, what happened when I integrated the uh, the reader, the article reader module, and you saw that it created a new dependency. This is actually what was happening. We were just merging a Gradle file, a template, that the only thing that was doing was adding that dependency. We're merging that into the already existing Gradle file. So again, like very powerful. And then you can just open a file, so nothing special there. Um, the globals, like I say, it's just a bunch of variables that you can reduce as you want. Um, and then this is the actual template, how, how it looks like. Uh, again, very simple, it's just code with different variables. Uh, that's it. And the question, I guess, is, well, what happens when you um, upgrade to Android Studio like 3.5 or 3.4 or whatever? Because we're storing all the templates inside um, the Android Studio folder. So basically what happens is the Android Studio tells you that there is something that he can't understand, some conflicts, and it's just going to delete everything. So that means that now you're going to have to copy and paste them again, which is uh, a bit of a shame. But thankfully, um, Rebecca, who is also uh, speaking today here, um, she created this uh, issue on the uh, tracker. And now, uh, well, not now, like from Android 3.1, now we have a new place where we can put our templates and they're not going to get deleted. So this new place is this dot android slash template slice other. Um, so if we put our templates there, they're going to live throughout the different uh, versions of Android Studio. So that's where we should actually be putting them. But again, the question is, how do we share them? Because I don't want to have to manually copy anything. I just want to ev everyone who has my plugin to be able to use my templates. And Unfortunately, the answer is not as straightforward as with live templates because um, here what we have to do is that we're going to put them again in the resources folder. And now what we're going to do is like we're just going to have to be a bit more creative. So we're going to create a new action to just copy those templates from the jar into this new place that Under Studio uh, is given to us. I'm not going to go into detail on this copy templates method because it's uh, stupidly complicated because uh, we're not copying files from one directory to another. We're copying files from a jar into a directory. Um, so feel free to check that out on the GitHub repo. But again, this requires a manual step. So now the users have to go to this action and click on the action. And I don't want them to do that. So what we can do is we can modify this first component that we wrote. So rather than saying if there is a new version, we can say if there are new templates available, then we can just copy them. So the user doesn't really have to do anything. It's just done automatically for him. And the last thing to finish off is like, I'm going to tell you how can you get this Android demo app module uh, or the other ones inside there. Because again, it's really simple. So you have your templates. The user has already copied them into uh, the right folder. Now, how can you do this with those templates? And this is yet another extension. So. Uh, in this case, we need to implement this module description provider extension, which is going to give us a list of uh, gallery entries. So it's a bit, it's not very straightforward as the other ones. So what we do here is that we use the template manager from the Android plugin. Template manager is going to give us all the places where the templates can be stored. So we have to loop through them, stop at the place that we want, in this case, the dot .android uh, folder there. And then we just filter them. So we check if they have metadata, and we check if they are the category that we want to be. And in that case, we just add them to the list of uh, galleries. And this demo module entry, what it does is uh, has to implement this uh, template gallery entry. And to do this, what I'm, what I'm doing just for simplicity again is like I'm reducing what the Android plugin is giving to me, which is this configure Android module step. So the only thing you have to do here is just create the different steps for your wizard. Um, so here I'm just reducing whatever they're giving me because it's free. 
The only problem with this is that I'm going to have to have their same, the same UI that they give me. So if I wanted to have my own UI, then I will have to create my own steps. Uh, but I'll let you do that if you want. So that was everything that I, I had for today. I know it was a lot to take in, uh, a lot of code there. Um, just one thing before I wrap this up. Um, so I'm actually, I'm a very shy person. I'm quite introvert, like believe it or not. So I know that a lot of people, they find it difficult to just come and ask questions or raise your hand now, whatever. So what I do in the conference that I go as an icebreaker is that I have a lot of these candies, they're called chupa chups, you might know them. Um, so as an icebreaker, if you're gonna talk to me and you don't really know what to say, you can just come and say, hey, can I have a candy? And then I'll give you a candy, and then we can start a conversation. <laughs> now, I am fully aware that you shouldn't trust people that give candies away for free. <laughs> but I swear that you can trust me. <laughs> Although that's what Sarah Clear would say anyway. So, yeah. um, so yeah, so again, that, that was everything. Uh, I hope you can walk away from here and start thinking about the ways that you can automate different processes. Uh, Everything that I've talked about today, uh, it's here, and that's the plugin repo, the demo uh, repo as well. Those are the slides. And this is like a little series of uh, blog posts that I've been writing uh, for a few months now, which kind of like goes step by step into the whole process of writing a new plugin. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>